from a defabricated solar power garden shed in Rockland County, New York, USA. This is Stand Up with Pete Dominic. On today's episode, how to have dressing room conversation with your friend at the gym when they clearly have foot and mouth disease. And now, the podcast host who has no worries for such things because his friends at the gym are not cows, Pete Dominic. Well, yes, that is true, Pico, but I do have a lot of friends outside the gym who are all different kinds of livestock, so the danger does exist. Thank you very much, sir. Hello, my friends, and welcome to episode 800. Stand up with Pete Dominic. I'm not making a big deal out of it because I, well, I didn't plan anything and I wasn't really thinking about it and I only realized it this week. But I am very excited and very grateful to everybody who has supported me on this project over the past almost three years now. And I can't do it without you. So let's keep it going. Shall we stand up with Pete.com? If you're not a subscriber, sign up now. And welcome to it. Thank you all so much. I will give you a big thank you tonight if you join me for the subscriber hangout. That's at 8 p.m. East. The link, Zoom link, is in everyday subscriber email. I hope to see you tonight, and we will celebrate then. That is, if I make it back from the Catskills, where I'm meeting up with the uh, the old man. We're going to do some skiing on Thursday, so expect the Friday show maybe to be a little bit late. But let's get to today's show I looked at the news, by the way, and I don't know. I didn't really see a lot, and I was really super busy today and couldn't get to a bunch of news as much as I did. So let's take the day off from recapping the news, because I have two great guests joining me on today's show. And both of these guests are joining me for the first time. I love the news organization Popular Info run by Judd Legum. He does great, great work. He's broken some major and important stories over there. And I talked to his new colleague, new reporter that he's hired, Tasneem Zakaria, for the first time today. And we talked about her piece on deregulating child labor in the United States. It's crazy what's happening, and I learned a lot from her piece, and we had a great conversation. But before that, I've got an awesome conversation with another guest who's joining me for the first time. She is the author of four books, all nonfiction, Squeezed, Why Our Families Can't Afford America, and Branded, The Buying and Selling of Teenagers. Then two books of poetry, and now she's written Bootstrapped, liberating ourselves from the American dream. Very excited to have the executive director of the Economic Hardship Reporting Project, who has been published in the Washington Post, the New York Times. She was on MSNBC talking about her book yesterday. We had an awesome conversation about this really important subject that I'll never stop thinking about, reading about, and trying to work on making better. I think you're really going to like my conversation with Alyssa Court. And I hope that you will let her know on Twitter and look her up and get the book. So we'll do that first, and then we'll get to my second conversation with Tasneem Zekaria. And I'm very excited to have all of you listening today on show number 800. Look forward to celebrating with you tonight. But ladies and gentlemen, the author of Bootstrap, Liberating Ourselves from the American Dream, Alyssa Court. Let's do it. All right, there she is, and I'm very excited to talk to her about her fifth book. It's just out, Bootstrapped, Liberating Ourselves from the American Dream. Alyssa Court, what an honor. Thank you for joining me. Oh, thank you so much, Pete. It's great to be here. I've really enjoyed our our pre-record conversation for two people that have not, I don't think, ever talked. It was it's, It's really great to get to know you and talk to you. Yeah, yeah. Get right in there. We're ready. We're ready. Let's go. This is a book that is so, so needed. Before we get into the specific, how do you arrive at this work talking about Americans and economics and wealth inequality? I know that you're a disciple of the great Barbara Ehrenreich, who you had a great relationship with. Yeah, I'm a disciple. I was like a spouse. I was a collaborator. Uh, We created this organization called the Economic Hardship Reporting Project. I met her like 10 years ago. And yeah, she changed my life. And she changed my life before that because I, I think it's really important that People write about poverty, inequality with humor and with uh, skin in the game, right? And also uh, not being afraid to uh, take a stand, which I think is something that sometimes traditional journalists shy away from. Give me an, what, what do you mean by that, that final point about taking a stand and traditional journalists shying away from it? When talking about this type of reporting, this subject matter, yeah. I think that you're discussing not generally everything, but certainly yeah. this. 
I mean, this is a human, these, these are whether clinically or legally or not, the human rights violations to have this level of people experiencing homelessness or food, food shortage or people being having their wages garnished, being paid less than $15 an hour. You know, like I think we can report on it neutrally, but at some point we really have to say what we think. And that was something that, uh, that Barbara was great at, like she, and she did it with such a scabrous humor and a kind of acid wit that people could take it. They weren't like, Oh, I'm being scolded. They're like, or thank you, please scold me again. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think yeah. that's, I think I'm glad you make that point. I think it's such an important point when talking about these issues, it's important to talk about them in a way that people will stay engaged. That's mm -hmm. how I come to this work as well. I mean, I've spent years just as a comedian and I thought, well, the only way to cut through apathy and to talk about important issues that impact a lot of people that are often depressing and serious is to do it in such a way that it's engaging, hopefully with humor and wit, as you mentioned. But big corporate media doesn't like this as I often cite an example when I pitched to the president of Sirius XM at the time. Can I go and live in for a short periods of time, like the poorest zip codes in the country and like do shows from there and talk to those folks. He goes, no, that's depressing. Yeah. But it's, you know, what's interesting though, is that this is part of why I made this whole emphasis in my book is I see it as radical self-help for people who are in the slipping down middle class to recognize that there's like structural forces arrayed against them. And part of that is knowing more about poverty and inequality. So you don't think, oh, it's my fault. What have I done wrong? Why am I such a failure? That in some ways it's less depressing to realize that things uh, are from the tax code to the way that we're hired as workers to the way we have to think about ourselves. You know, the, the, somebody called it a folk psychology, mm. us being self-made that just pollutes a lot of our view of ourselves and others. It's good to be aware of that. So then you can kind of go on with your life being like, Oh, it's not me. It's, it's the broader system that I'm in. Folk know? psychology for sure. Uh, let's start with <laughs> kind of, you know, where, where these ideas started from here in America, you write about the Horatio Alger lie. His whole life seems to have been a lie. <laughs> yeah. But we're uh, like just, Cr like just a crazy set of uh, truths that somehow everybody overlooked. You know, this guy was, you know, acknowledged, I want to say pedophile, but he he acknowledged to have committed pedophilic acts. Like that's what we know, right? Yeah. He, he abused young uh, boys when he was a minister. Uh, he then became a writer, which is what one does, right? <laughs> you know, you Comes a, comes a writer. Uh, you can't, you can't minister. You write. Um, and then he starts going on the Bowery um, and meeting these young boys on the Bowery who are also kind of street urchins, really vulnerable. And we don't know what happened, but he adopted two of them. Right. But the point about this is not just like a gotcha, like look at this, you know, uh, whatever uh, TMZ for, you know, the 19th century, <laughs> although that would be actually a good book, you know? <laughs> Yeah, there'd be there'd be no shortage of content there. It'd be hard no, to source no, it. But it'd the, be hard to exactly. But it is it is a little bit that it's like Horatio Alger was a pervert, basically. But um, also, you know, we continue to have this phrase, the Horatio Alger story. And if we're questioning uh, so many different things in this country about whether these words are this word is appropriate, that word is about like you think Horatio Alger story, that's pretty clearly we should probably put that to rest. Now we know that this person um, not only did these things, but then also if you look at his novels, which are terrible, he wrote 128 and they were awful. And I read a lot of them. Um, and they always have a beautiful young man being helped by an older man. Huh? No surprise there. How about but, it? But, <laughs> but, but which is actually probably closer to the way that power worked in, you know, the late 19th, early 20th century, than you know, rags to riches, someone coming from the Bowery and becoming, you know, a ty tycoon. But that was somehow taken as a story of rags to riches being self-made. Like he actually did not even write that story. He wrote a different story. He wrote a story about young men being helped by rich old men. It's like not the same story. So there's so many reasons to retire the phrase, the Horatio Alger story, and so many reasons to retire that whole framework. Well, right? the, the framework being he wrote a lot about uh, uh, kids who grew up 
poor boys, especially who, who made it uh, to the middle class or more. The rags to riches. That's what he's known for. And yeah. America has become known for that. And for so many different reasons, which you write about in, in, in the backstory and a chapter called Little House of Propaganda, hosting a live radio show for 12 years, as I did, talking about economics and wealth inequality and wage issues and all of it, every economic possible. I would hear from these people that you talk about that you interviewed for your book over and over. I did it myself. You know, if I can do it, so can he. So can she. And I would hear that all the time, Alyssa. Yeah. And that's I part of why I wrote this book. I call it the peanut gallery was the peanut gallery of commenters who were just like um, coming out of the woodwork whenever I'd publish pieces. Because I wrote a previous book called Squeezed, which is on the fragile middle class. Right. So it's about people, journalists, lawyer, even lawyers, uh, you know, accountants, librarians, academics who were somehow living hand to mouth in this country, which seemed really sh- surprising to me. Right. But anyway, so I'd written that book and then I got all this response like, stop their whining. You know, why they go to college? Why didn't they go to college? Why they own their home? Why don't they own their home? Why do they go out to eat? <laughs> it's like, we haven't gone out to eat in seven years. I'm like, okay, your, your marriage must not be very good. At this point. <laughs> like your, your wife's cooking every night. Anyway, but yeah, so uh, it was sort of like these constant <laughs> n- refrain and these commenters. And I was like, what is going on? And that's why I want to look into this folk psychology and this myth to figure out what is surging through all these people that they feel like they need to point the finger at everybody else and everybody else's economic instability. And somehow that will protect them. I think they felt they, they would be protected if they could find some flaw in somebody that made them vulnerable economically, because then they'll never be vulnerable. Right. And it's the kind of thing people do when people get sick too, honestly, physically sick, Pete, they, they yes. say, Oh, that person, they smoked or they, you know, um, and sometimes there's some truth in it, but sometimes it's just like, no, it's completely happenstance why we get ill right and you know it makes the healthy feel safer when they accuse the ill right of somehow having a role in it and i I see economic fragility as sort of a little bit along the same lines right i won't lose my job if i find the moral reason why this person over there lost their job you know what i mean I I do know what you mean, because what you mean, you write about it. And I agree with so much of what you identify here, but didn't know so much about the research. And you you interview so many actual individual Americans and living in all kinds of different categories, like a farmer who's a big Trump supporter out in Wisconsin. And it's it's heart wrenching uh, to read his story, but so important that you and are reporting on it. But what you mean, I think, is choices, whether it be health care or whether it be your job situation, your career situation you should have made better choices. It infuriates me. It yeah. infuriates me that people say that. I even say it sometimes, what, to, even to my kids, make better choices. Yeah, make better choices. It is really not how the world works. It's not about a set of choices. We don't all have the same A opportunities. And even if we did have the same opportunities, we are different people ca- arriving at this situation. So what you think are your choices might not be what I think are my choices. And, we also don't have the same abilities. Um you know, some of us are disabled. Some of us are good, like naturally good at math. I'm thinking about my daughter, <laughs> you know, uh, or, appear, uh, you know, or appearance like matters yeah. too. Like I'm, be- I'm such an attractive person and yeah, not yeah, everybody yeah. is looks yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, yeah. Uh, like that matters. Yeah. And, or, you know, I, I came from, um, you know, a family that owned property, you know, like I did not actually, but, uh, you know, people, this is like another thing that people deny. Uh, and they, there was a, a study done that showed that 60% of the people on the Fortune 400 um, list came from at least upper middle class backgrounds, right? So that it's not like they all came from extreme wealth, but like Elon Musk's, you know, father was uh, whatever. He says that he didn't own um, multiple mines, but in, uh, in South Africa, but you know, he definitely was wealthy. Like these, these folks came from, as I say, like second base, if not third, right? Yeah. Um, And so I think that's really important. We have to when we say choices, it's like choices within a limited set, right? That's just like a basic of like statistics, right? People, you know, do things within a limited set. And so much of what we have in this life, we don't choose. And I don't think, I think people say that's just depressing or sad sack to dwell on that. But I also think there's something again, liberating about it. If you're like, Oh, a lot of what we start with, we don't choose. So again, this, let's move away the cobwebs of self-blame here, you know? 
there's so much in here. It's so hard to do an interview in a, uh, on this book because Alyssa has written such a really important book. Everybody should just go buy it. But I'm going to pick. I'm going to. Uh, I mean, there's still so much to talk about in terms of. I got to ask one more time how we got here. The creation of this myth of individualism. You write so much about this. You did so much research. We touched on it a little bit. But tell me um, anything else you want to tell about how we arrived at this. I certainly can talk a lot about media and what I've heard coming out of radios for years and years and years, but you can go uh, to that or just about anything else. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think how we got here, we had, you know, a lot of kind of cultural production in the 19th century that started to try to explain or justify entrepreneurship, right? Like 1830s, culture, which was like steamships and, you know, um, plantations, um, right. And slave people that we, again, were denying their, and so the person who coined the term self-made man was a Kentucky uh, politician who coined it in a speech in, you know, one of the house of representatives. Right. And so like, that's, we need to remember that, that that's also part of this, right. It was like, what are we not talking about when we're talking about self-made? You know, my, my big line is if you think you're self-made, call your mother. Yeah. But the but 19th century, big push towards this. But a lot of also another thing to think about, a lot of these phrases started out as jokes, like pulling yourself up by your bootstraps first used in the 1830s and as a complete joke and try to like, how are you going to pull yourself up by your bootstraps? I actually tried once just because I was writing this book. I was like, all right, I'm going to I'm going to see because I wanted to be able to describe it physically. And it was like, Putting, it was some combo <laughs> of like putting on your skis and it like with like numb fingers or like, yeah, it was ridiculous. Like, I guess Simone Biles could probably do this, but like most of us could not pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. So that everyone understood it was like, ha ha ha, but you know, 1830s, oh, pull yourself up. Within a couple of decades, that's, suddenly that's it was where these thing. myths start to be made. Like you have someone like, uh, you know, Ralph Waldo Emerson or Thoreau writing beautifully about nonconformity and self-reliance. And I sort of go through some of it and, and take the piss a little bit out of them too. Yeah. I was surprised by your ridicule <laughs> of both these great American men. I was, a, I was also deeply offended uh, as I'm currently reading Walden. I was so offended for him and I wanted to make sure you, you realize You're offended? how offended I am. <laughs> no. Yeah. I was surprised. I, I was surprised and that I hadn't thought of it that way. And your your critique and your writing about it was very interesting. I've I I've always thought a lot of their writing and a lot of the, the some some of the what I would describe as yeah. more anti capitalist well, ideas and to a certain part extent. Part of why I wanted to go after them in this a little bit, go and I did uh was because I feel like there are sort of our self made men theorists. Like if Horatio Alger has become a stand in for like and I'm just pretending that we're we agree politically. I don't know fully what our, your politics are, but like as somebody who, you know, progressive, I, I feel drawn to self-reliance as a form of nonconformity or self-reliance as a form of self-actualization rather than pull yourself up by your bootstraps, drive that truck and make that money by yourself. Right. Like we, we understand that that's going to be hard for a lot of people. But there is a sneaking suspicion that we're supposed to be able to become our best selves by ourselves. And I think that that's the poetic and lyrical and psychological piece of this that is closer to Emerson and Thoreau. One of the most ridiculous, by the way, I'm probably to the left of Chomsky, but one of the, (laughs) I don't know, one of the most ridiculous things to me about this, uh, these theories are that none of them really can be instituted, played out, or lived up to if you don't have health insurance. You can be the hardest working, most masculine man who can fix anything at all. If you accidentally break your leg, if you get a virus, if you hurt yourself that you can't be out on the farm, then what are you supposed to do? It's not about you. You didn't make bad choices. Universal health insurance is something that almost every other civilized country in the world has. But here in America, where we're supposed to be individuals, if you get hurt, sick or injured, what are you supposed to do? Aren't we that shouldn't we be able to depend on our neighbors at that point to, by the way, you know, pay into the pool that we're all in a policy for much less any other reason? Yeah. So, I mean, I think that's part of this context, too. Like we don't have I mean, you know, I was, I was looking at the OECD numbers for developed, I don't know, developed countries, um, industrial 
industrialized nations and the U.S. has some of the lowest payout for child care of any GDP out of any GDP. And that, you know, that's really important. That's something that's keeping people back. But like lots of other things, like you just you mentioned that farmer and, you know, he was having trouble. He's a milk farmer. And there's a lot of kind of problems right now with keeping farms going and sustainable. And he turned into a a serious Trump supporter, I think, partially because of that. So I wanted to also show that the self-made myth, it's not just held by people who are privileged. It's also held by people who are struggling because they want they want in. And I wanted to do justice to his struggle in a sense. You know? And he had voted for Obama, but said things had gotten worse on his farm. And yeah. then he wanted to go for the self-made guy. And then you told yeah. him that Trump was not yeah. in fact self-made. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, it was a real, it's an, it really intimate, you know, you, you clearly spent a good amount of time talking with him and, and, and he brings up, I feel like a lot of issues as I was talking to you right before I hit record where men certainly of a certain age think they've done everything right. And they find the bottom has fallen out and, and then they can't admit that. Uh, they can't talk about it. Uh, they've got no options. And as we talked about, there's a there's a suicide epidemic with farmers. Mm-hmm. And you can understand to a certain extent about that. But there's also a depression and suicide epidemic with men of a certain age as yeah. well. Because, I mean, uh, I, I, Pete, honestly, I've lost a number of people to suicide men over at like late 40s, 50 people who had underlying psychiatric issues. But they also were all struggling professionally. Uh, uh, and they were and I felt like that this is. It was something that really hit me, even though I, I wouldn't say they were the closest, but they're people I'd worked with. And, you know, I, I guess I, I I saw it as that some of it, at least some part of it was this, this sense that they had failed and that they were alone responsible for that failure. And yeah, I know I failed a bunch of times, which is why when I do. I do my best to talk about it into this microphone and and tell every guy I know because they too have failed and then I don't feel alone and then I can get better and I can use that interdependence that you write a lot about as opposed to this individualism of the guy who's afraid to say that he failed. I mean, there's there's so much shame and then that, that leads to loneliness. Totally. And part of the transparency that I'm, I'm arguing for. And I just wrote an op-ed in the times about this. I call it the art of dependence. That's very good. I read it and shared it. Oh, thank you. We're, we're, but where people, you know, are come out as dependent. I even wrote a, I tweeted this dependence, come out dependence, pride. (laughs) And like, so let's like try to reframe this a little where it's not just like a bunch of emotional or physical weaklings who are dependent on others, but that, that there's something beautiful, powerful, uh, skilled about being dependent on others, other people, and even the state and doctors or even, you know, a range of people. And yeah. And I wonder if the guys I know who committed suicide, like what would have happened if they had been able to talk about this? I, but I want to make sure as much as I can, that people feel like they can be transparent. Absolutely. And that this discourse of failure and success is complicated at least. Right. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Like just something people have an idea like, no, you can't do it on your own. A lot of the self-reliance pablum exists to convince people who are lower middle class to keep working for wealthy people. (laughs) I think it's like that's part of it. That part of my project is myth busting. So people are like, oh, you know, I can't do this alone. And I'm actually being asked to serve a societal function when I'm being asked to do it alone. What about the story that we've been told about when we'll be happy, Alyssa? I mean, I'm not going to be happy until that I get this job, this promotion, this item, this idea of consumerism. And I think so many of us, men and women, suffer from that. And we're never going to be at there isn't a thing or a situation that's going to be to make you happy past a certain point. Research shows, uh, uh, you know, money, income, which is not that much and, and, you know, other statistical things that you achieve in your life. After that, uh, things and, and situations don't necessarily uh, create happiness, but we've been told they do. So we keep buying, we keep working for the man. Yeah. You know, there was when I was doing the reporting for my book, I, I found a, a survey from the University of Chicago in 2020 that only 14 percent of U.S. adults report being very happy. Hmm. So that is. But in some ways, couldn't that be a source of comfort? Like if you didn't feel happy, it's like not what's wrong with me, but like 
if you are very happy, what's right with me? Like, let's just, again, invert this, you know? I like that. Let's talk about part two of your book, Brokers of the American Dream, Rich Fictions, The Self-Made Voter, and Zen Incorporated, which I thought was particularly interesting because I've been subject to practiced and even to some extent proselytize that that idea. But let's just talk about the self-made voter. We mentioned the farmer in in uh, Wisconsin whose name is escaping me. Is it Ray? But like there's so much more than that to to this idea. Go ahead. Yeah, the self-made voter that people had done this uh this, this, uh, these researchers had done a study of voters in the Midwest, and they'd asked Republican and Republican-leaning voters who they voted for and why, and they'd asked a very pointed question about the candidate. In this case, it was Trump being self-made, which we know he was not self-made, but it turned out that a lot of the voters believed he was. And I found that interesting. And then the second part of this was really interesting, that when they told him, explained and broke down the ways in which he was not self-made, these voters to a, like a large number of them were like, I would not vote for him. So a part of me was like, this is a really interesting political project for someone to do, potentially a Democrat, <laughs> to really, instead of being like, I made it kind of Horatio Alger, which a lot of Democrats do when they're doing stump speeches. And also partially because 51% of the House of Representatives are millionaires, right? So like, they, what else are they going to do? They are Horatio Alger at best, right? But instead being like, let's demystify the self-made myth. Let's not, let, let's not use it to get votes. Let's actually try to break it down when other people are using it. The way in which people were beneficiaries of their privilege, the way in which how honorable it is when you have someone like AOC who came out about not being able to pay her rent at D.C. Do you remember that? Yeah, the Maxwell Frost, I think, the Frost. freshman congressman. I just actually wrote about that It's in a piece that's coming out tomorrow about Maxwell Frost because so they make $174,000 a year, the Congress people. But if you came from a working class background, student debt, like I think Maxwell Frost did, you're not going to be having that money up front. So he couldn't afford an apartment. So he was like couch surfing with friends, which is, you know, and then all these Republicans were mocking him. And what, but I loved what he did. He said he used bootstraps. He says, I am not going to buy into this bootstraps vision. And to me, that's like, what we need more of in American politics. It's like not trying to join them in their bootstrapping culture, but if anything, trying to demystify it and show the lie of it for the majority of us. What do you think about just lying about all of it? Speaking of lies, like George Santos, maybe you could just lie about how all the things that you got in your life and how you got (laughs) that seems, seems to be pretty successful. He's still there. (laughs) It's just so crazy. But also like with him, it's sort of interesting because this, He's not, it's not just a, um, one, his, his own fabrication seemed more complicated. Like he's, he fabricates vulnerability and trauma, right? He fabricates different minority identities than the one he belongs. I mean, yeah. I don't know. He's just insane. Like, I don't know if he, but there is an element obviously of the self-made man in him too, right? He, that he thinks he can be anything and, um, you know. Tell me about Zen Incorporated. Uh, this chapter to me was was really interesting. I learned probably as much here as anywhere. Uh, and and I practice a lot of this. I think about a lot of this. And I think it's good that we're teaching mindfulness in schools and in corporations. But 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 not, maybe not so much after reading this chapter. Yeah. So, I mean, my point here is not to attack mindfulness, which I, I, I hate personally, but I, I know it's very important. And like, I try to, I try to try to use it. I just, I don't like sitting still, uh, whatever. Uh, but one thing that I saw with all this kind of uh, craze for corporate mindfulness, and this is again, where I wanted to include people like you and I in the self-made myth. So it's not just like, over there are the right wing people who are trying to, you know, yeah. punish pe- people for needing healthcare. Um, I think there there's a self punishing element with progressives around things like mindfulness. Like, why are you not more able to control your breathing? Why are you not more uh, content or self actualized? And I would try to kind of myth bust that a little. And looking at the way that people talk about corporate mindfulness, I mean, it's almost entirely uh, what they'll cost. So, like uh, one one factoid was a highly stressed employee costs 2000 more in healthcare while productivity nets $3,000 more per mindful employee. So this is really what's going on, right? There's not. And if that's what's going on, you're not going to be able to get the release uh, from your 
struggle as an employee, which is probably involves your boss and your coworkers and a whole complicated set of things on your job, right? And or even in, like personal stresses. Instead, you're going to be asked to, you know, breathe. You know, during uh, I think it was right before the pandemic, 84% of respondents said at least one workplace factor negatively impacted their mental health. How honest are you going to be if you're in this corporate mindfulness right. class talking about this? Not, not very. So that's the point of that chapter. Also, I love this Amazon. Oh, yeah. Yeah. A- yeah. Am- Amazon. It's yeah. perfect. Well, I mean, the idea that all of it is to make you create a more uh, pro- productive employee Mm-hmm. It's all about if you can, if you can, anything we can do, any hack, life hack, such a ridiculous term that we can do so that you'll put out more. I mean, I don't know why people won't listen to me and just institute a nap and build a nap room because you get you get two full days out of a person if they just let them nap whenever they feel tie tie is what I always say. But I mean, the whole point is so that you'll produce more widgets so that you'll make more money because you're more, quote, relaxed, healthy, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I didn't want to just sneer at mindfulness. So I went to some mindfulness classes that were not corporate because I felt like I wanted to show that, yeah, they're when they are more peer to peer, when they are more oriented towards mutual aid and not just about squeezing more work out of an employee, there's something really useful about these practices. Like it's not just like, and there's even, there's a whole political movement around like the new mindful deal. So I write about this. There's yeah. sort of people who are trying to get, these to uh, deprivatize mindfulness because it's now become like earth balance, mindful, sa- you know, salad dressing. Right, like, right. You know, let's like try to take it back. So again, it's like another thing we have to take back. So it is yet again about actual human experience. Yeah. Um, I could keep talking. I know I've taken up a ton of your time, but let's end on uh, the, the final part of your book, which is uh, part four toward a new American dream, which is where, you offer up some ideas and solutions about how to think things differently. Tell me any any takeaway you want from this final part of the book about how we could be better and 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 once we understand these myths that we've been told, make quote better choices uh, yeah. or institute policy ideas that will create a different atmosphere of interdependence as opposed to individualism. So I mean, I have so many of these fixes, and it was partially because I felt. In my previous books, you know, they had a more tragedian feeling like it's just like things are getting worse and worse. And then here's like, and the the way that contemporary nonfiction works, like, and then you, you know, like graft on one kind of fixes solutions chapter. But I really have, you know, renewed my interest in solutions, but not the solutions that are um, necessarily easy. I mean, these are going to be bigger solutions. Uh, bigger or smaller. So the smaller ones include things like worker co-ops where uh, the workers own their own labor and they're on the rise or participatory budgeting where ordinary citizens are part of deciding where uh, cities budgets go. And so I think it's practiced now in like 487 cities and, you know, it changes where the police budget goes. And it's a kind of a really important form of collective uh, effort. It's not just who you vote for, although that is important too, because Part of why we're not hearing as many Horatio Alger stories is we have the most diverse, like people of color Congress ever, and we have the most female, 28% now of the House is female. And I think that is part of why you're hearing these self-made man stories being complicated by people like Maxwell Frost. So that's important to keep doing that voting. And finally, I think it's important to embrace what I call public happiness, or I call it that because it was called by, uh, I think, Hannah Rent or something, <laughs> but like, you know, or radical joy or this kind of uh, communal luxury is another, another term people use where, you know, we think about the joy and pleasure that's possible through solidarity. And this is the point of that essay I just wrote, Art of Dependence, that there's beauty, craft, and intimacy in depending on others and having others depend on you. And that reframe is something very fundamental that we can actually start making on our, in our own lives today. So much goodness in this book and all your work. And I'm really happy to finally have taught to you bootstrapped, liberating ourselves from the American dream. Everybody go buy this book and, uh, and learn about everything we've been talking more specifically. Alyssa, thank you so much for joining me. It's really, really great. Congrats. Thank Thank you, Pete. Take care.
All right, there she goes. Please go let her know you heard her on the show. Go reach out to her. Get the book, Bootstrap, Liberating Ourselves from the American Dream. It's really, really good. I don't think I did it enough justice in my conversation with her just now because we were jumping all over the place, but I highly recommend that you get that book. And she is great, and I hope to get her back on soon because she's uh, continuing where Barbara Ehrenreich left off and do doing really, really good work. All right. Well, I also want to talk about child labor. How about that? Have you heard about the Arkansas governor? Well, it's not just her. She uh, signed new legislation last week, I think it was, into law that eliminated age verification requirements for youth workers younger than 16 years old. A similar proposal is advancing in Missouri. Iowa legislators are considering a bill that would allow 14 and 15 year olds to work certain jobs in meat packing plants and shield businesses from civil liability. If a child laborer is sickened, injured or killed on the job, then you got a bill in Minnesota that would permit 16 and 17 year olds to work construction jobs. So instead of making it easier to hire youths for dangerous work, governments should try to increase accountability and ramp up enforcement, according to the current labor secret, uh, solicitor, Seema Nanda. She says no child should be working in dangerous workplaces in this country, full stop. And here is a recent report from NBC News, Ju- uh, Julius Ainsley. Tonight, alarming accusations about what happened inside this Nebraska meatpacking plant. Migrant children like this boy, who federal investigators say was put to work in a job that can be incredibly dangerous. Could anybody mistake these children for adults? I don't think there's any mistaking these children for adults. Investigators say the child workers arrived for their shift at night, many of them from Central America. They were employed by cleaning company Packer Sanitation Services, Inc. to sanitize equipment inside the plant. PSSI has 17,000 workers. Of those, investigators say the company employed more than 100 children aged 13 to 17 and 13 plants across eight states. Last October, labor investigators say they found nearly two dozen children, some as young as 13, working here inside this massive slaughterhouse, cleaning up blood and animal parts in the overnight shift. Nebraska immigrant advocate Audrey Lutz has been helping some of the child workers from Guatemala, who she says are scared to talk to us. I think these youth are afraid because they don't know the systems in this country that were meant to protect them because those systems failed. All right. Now here to talk about it is Tezneem Zakaria. You can follow her on Twitter at Tez Zeeks. He's a Philadelphia-based researcher and writer for the accountability newsletter Popular Information, which I am a paid subscriber to, Judge Legum's outfit. Really good work over there. Her reporting includes investigations into the purge of left-leaning tenured faculty by former Coke executives. That's Coke Industries, not Coca-Cola. A deep dive on the wage theft scandal at Kroger. Several stories on the companies donating to anti-LGBTQ and anti-abortion politicians. Previously, she worked at Atlantic Media, where she co-wrote the idea. She's also collaborated with the Google News Initiative on efforts to support small and medium-sized news organizations worldwide. Really happy to have her on for the first time. And let's do it right now with Tess, as she goes by, Tesneem Zakaria. Tess, thank you very much for joining me for the first time. Big fan of Judd and your work at popular.info. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Glad to be here. I say us. I mean, you know, people listening, it's just me and my, in my shed here, but I'm psyched to talk to you. I've been reading a lot of your work and following your work and of course, following Judd for a long time. If people don't know, uh, talk a little bit about popular info and why you decided, uh, you know, to work there and how in any way you've seen, and even your, you know, you're younger, but still in your short career, the the entire industry change rapidly and why Popular Info is a great place to be now. Yeah. So Popular Information, for those who don't know, is an accountability newsletter. So we focus on corporate and political accountability. When talking with friends, I like to brag that we bully companies for the better. So <laughs> that's not uh, by any means a formal description, but just kind of how I like to pitch it to others. I joined about two years ago, and to be honest, at the time I was working at another news organization, and I was just so I was doing all this like newsletter research on like politics newsletters that exist out there, and I was looking at ones from like you know mostly mostly legacy news orgs, and right. kind of stumbled across Popular Information, and it was then that I kind of reading like ten political newsletters in the morning uh, side by side really. Uh, shows you which ones are like doing things and which ones aren't like no shade. 
But um, popular information felt like just like, you know, a slap in the morning as far as like, we need to wake up. There is like stuff happening. You need to be aware. This is what's going on. And I just remember thinking to myself, like, I would love to work there. And that's kind of how I heard about it. And then thankfully, just shortly after, like a few months after that project I was working on, there was actually an opening. So kind of worked out uh, quite nicely, I'd say. Just that, that's so awesome. That's great to hear. And that's an interesting uh, journey to get there. Looking at all those newsletters, uh, as I have too. we could have a, a separate, maybe off air conversation, just trashing them. But, I, you know, <laughs> when you talk about accountability journalism, what you mean is that you'll call up an individual or an organization or you'll contact them and ask them for comment on a story you're doing before, of course, you do the story. That's how journalism, the type that you're doing, obviously, is supposed to be practiced. But what gives you guys the weight at this point? Because I think that's what's really impressive about the work that you guys are doing over there is you've broken some really big stories as a small independent outfit. My question is, why am I getting back to you? Tess who? Like, I don't care what what you're going to print. Go ahead, print it. How do you get people and organizations to respond to you? I mean, no, they don't always. But how when they do, what kind of pressure can you put to bear? Yeah, I think evidence. So Judd, the founder of the newsletter, you know, is a lawyer by training. And I think he's someone who's really good at just making sure he has all the evidence and presenting it in a way that makes it hard to not respond. Right. And so what we do a lot of what we're known for, I would say, is probably the fact that we will take the time to sift through campaign finance records, which is honestly burdensome and especially when you look at state campaign finances, uh, the systems are really like outdated and it's kind of difficult to navigate. So it requires a lot of patience and just honestly commitment to, to the outcomes in order to kind of like take the time to like, you know, sift through all of that. But that's like an ethic that I think I, a work ethic that I really admire from Judd. And I think it's something that translates down into myself and my colleague, Rebecca as well. When, when you're looking for that kind of stuff, I mean, just real quick, if, if I think I know what you're talking about, wouldn't it be helpful to have, laws that created more transparency and disclosure when you're looking at who's donating to a campaign? I mean, completely. Yeah, I think. Yeah. I mean, it it would also be nice to, you know, maybe update some of the existing systems. You know, the federal campaign finances are, you know, fairly easy to like navigate. But as far as when you get to states, it really is just kind of like there's just such a wide range. And so it's not lost on me that like in some states, like I can see why they don't even, you know, kind of move towards that kind of coverage only because it's probably really hard to do. And it's something that I think news, news organizations have attempted to figure out as far as like, are there, for instance, news products or tools that can make this type of reporting easier? But, you know, there's not that much investment for reasons that I'm sure you can guess. And so I think that it can be like the methods, at least for kind of gathering that kind of data, gathering that information can be can feel a bit outdated. But Th- that to say, there's still like cool tools out there. Um, and so hopefully this means that like as we go forward, that like others are going to start picking up on it, which we've kind of seen some bigger news organizations who've like kind of started doing a little bit more campaign finances, campaign finance oriented work where they're reporting donations. But for the most part, you know, that hasn't really been the case. And that's, you know, one reason is because a lot of these news organizations rely on corporations for ads. And so popular information, we take a lot of pride in the fact that we're not corporate backed. We're not taking any money from, you know, Walmart or Walgreens right. because we need, you know, their money in order to sustain our news organization. We're like strictly reader funded. Which yeah, is strictly cool. reader funded, as am I now at this point. Listener funded. Nobody's reading because I can't write. But you can. <laughs> How about that for a pivot towards your latest piece, deregulating child labor? So I saw your piece here first about this. I had seen the headlines about what the great governor of Arkansas has done, Sarah Huckabee. Mm -hmm. But I was pretty unfamiliar with the issue. And yours was the first piece I read. And then I realized there's been a lot of reporting on this over the past couple of years. Some deep investigations by some big outfits like The New York Times, NBC News on child labor. And it's a conversation piece. I, I really missed this. This issue, I haven't paid much attention to it. So my first question is, when you dug into this, how much reporting did did you see uh, covering this issue, which seems to me to be somewhat undercovered? But who am I to decide? Yeah, I think when I first started looking into it, I noticed that a lot of the coverage was kind of limited to local news outlets that, you know, were just kind of covering the bill as they would any other standard bill, just kind of saying like, hey, there's this bill coming that lawmakers are trying to advance. It does this and this and, you know, X, Y and Z. And I think at the time. Sometimes there are bills that are 
proposed, right, that are so, like, insane that you think to yourself, like, surely this is not going to make it anywhere. Like, this will probably be the first and the last that we'll hear of it. You hope that there's going to be, like, such overwhelming opposition that it just kind of dies there. But with the child labor bills, there's just been, like, you know, about three or four that have, like, come up this year. And when I was looking into it, I realized that actually, like, over the summer, there's been some, you know, movement around weakening child labor protections, Uh, And like even just years leading up into it. And so, I mean, much like you, I was also surprised to see that like this was something that has been going on for quite some time. And as early as like, I think there's like a interesting report from the Economic Policy Institute that shows that between 2011 and 2012, four states were kind of weakening child labor protections and passed bills that like did that. And so I was just surprised to see how, you know, how long this has been going on for. It's a really interesting problem to get to the root of and there's a lot of nuance yeah. there and it's easy to i guess uh pollute and, and, and demagogue in a way because you could easily say hey what's wrong with a 16 year old going to work at, a, at an ice cream shop and the answer would be nothing really you know but if they're exploited if their parents don't know if they're put in harm's way if they're injured and they don't actually have the right to file a lawsuit because the organizations have lobbied to get rid of that. That's a lot of what I what I learned is the situation here. But is as you said, it seems to be developing quickly. Tell me a little bit more about what you learned um, in Arkansas or any of these other states that are now trying to uh, pass these laws and who's behind funding them, as you tell us. Yeah. So a quick thing, too, that just occurred to me regarding like what we're talking about before is that I think one reason why these bills have gained momentum is that with COVID, there was people were dying and uh, that meant that there were going to be like, there's a labor shortage, right? Because of this mass death event that occurred. And so they've, what I've noticed at least is that they've been kind of using the labor shortage as justification for why we need to start. We need to turn to children and teenagers to fill in these gaps, which is really nefarious when you think about it, because of course, you know, in these arguments, there's no acknowledgement of COVID and why it got to be as bad as it became. And, you know, what could have done, what could have occurred to like prevent that? But that's a totally different topic. And I don't want to go on a tangent there. But regarding at least the bill in Arkansas, which is titled the Youth Hiring Act. And so that was signed into law earlier this month by Governor Sarah Huckabee Sanders. So what this law basically does is that it gets rid of the employment certificate that uh, 14 and 15 year olds needed to have in order to get a job. And this employment certificate was just like a one page form that a child needed to have filled out. Um, It required a signature from a parent. So that's just to ensure that the parent is aware. And you also needed to provide a verification of age. So, you know, like an ID, a birth certificate, or even just like a record from school. And then that would be sent off to the Arkansas Division of Labor, who would then, you know, approve it and say, yeah, you're good to go. You can go work at wherever, you know, this ice cream shop and whatnot. Um, But now with this law, their certificate is now gone. And, you know, what was interesting is that they kind of framed it as like, you know, we got to get rid of these arbitrary, quote, arbitrary burdens on parents, which is interesting, uh, considering that, you know, when you get rid of their certificate, right, you're getting rid of this, you know, formal parental signature sign off on this child's employment. You would think that like that's, you know, not that seems to be. Like it's disempowering parents as opposed to empowering of parents. Of course it is. Yeah, it's very the way the, that was, I think, the most enlightening thing that I learned from your reporting. You write that the state rep who sponsored the, quote, Youth Hiring Act described the law in terms of parents' rights. There it is, Tess. Parents' rights. That phrase is so powerful, yeah. saying it would remove the need for parents to get, quote, permission from the government for their child to work. But the new act- the new law, you're right, actually disempowers parents. Before, a parent would need to sign a child's employment certificate. Now, kids under 16 can work without any involvement from their parent or legal guardian. But when I read that, I thought of as any parent who cares a lot about my kid, conservative, liberal, whatever, I think that if my kid's going to go work for you, I should have to know. I should have to be able to give permission. I should know where they are. I should know who they are. I should know what everything about that. If I so desire, this is not giving parents more rights. It's clearly giving us less, at least rights, much less responsibility. It's the exact opposite. But the language 
is convincing. Sorry for ranting, but that's how that was the no. big the big part to me that stood out. I was like, no, none of this, none of this is 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 the way it is. Yeah, no, no. I think you're totally spot on. I think, I mean, I, you know, I think there's strong reason to believe why they use the framing of parental rights to push this legislation, which is that as we've seen with the anti LGBTQ laws and anti CRT laws, framing things as like. These are parents' rights. You know, we need to have the government stop interfering in interfering into parent, um, you know, parents' decisions is a really convincing way of kind of getting support. Um, and so, I think, I mean, I think, I think it, there's clearly a trend here as far as you know, pairing you know, really oppressive and like harmful policies with this rhetoric of like, well, you know, this is about giving parents their rights back and. You know, I think I think the it's other not thing even too about is that, giving like, their pay, it's not it's it's not even about <laughs> it's not about giving your parents your kids back. Like you don't get your kids; they're going to work, and you don't even know it. It's the most yeah bizarre yeah. twist on things, and it obviously is something that comes from the the lobbying of of business owners and bosses who look at this Completely. one way. I think I interrupted you though with 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 that. I'm sorry if I uh, if you no wanna, no. I mean, trust me, I, I, the rage and anger that you're feeling, I went through that as I was like delving into this. I think the other thing too, and advocates have been saying is that this is going to open up children to so many like vulnerabilities. I had a job when I was 15 and a half and I was not well-versed in child labor laws, right? Like I could not tell you, I could not tell you, you know, like what the limit, you know, of hours, like, you know, the hour limit that I could be working and like what policies, you know what I mean? I just wasn't well-versed no, in nothing. that. nothing. So, you know nothing. What if you get hurt? What are your rights? Exactly. What, what was your job? Do you mind me asking? I was working at a Kumon, which is like a math and reading tutoring center. <laughs> the highbrow so, job. What you, you were like a tutor? I was a tutor. Yeah. So oh, I wasn't wow. like, you know, at a slaughterhouse or anything, but like, <laughs> I think back to even then, you know, you're, you're 15, you're thinking like, I, I have a job, I'm getting a paycheck. I know like I should be able to like identify if like something was going wrong in my workplace. But the reality is, I mean, even adults themselves, like sometimes have trouble identifying if they're being exploited at work, if they're, you know, working overtime and not being compensated adequately. Right. And I think, Having a parent, let's say in this case, or an adult kind of who might be a little bit more aware, maybe not in all cases, um, is really important for a child as far as just, you know, having a trusted confidant or just adult in their life who they can go to in case these things are happening, in which case we know they are happening. And we know that child labor violations have also been on the rise. Yeah, there's so much more. Just I'll just share one quick anecdote. When I was 14, I wanted to desperately work at the New York State Fair. My buddy's dad owned all these like snow cone and cotton candy stands. You'd have like 10 of them throughout the fairgrounds there. And okay. I thought it sounded awesome to to do that. And it sounded like fun. And he wouldn't let me do it. And I cried. I remember crying because I couldn't go to work. And in <laughs> later on, we talked about that. And he's like, the guy that you were going to work for, I think, really would have like exploited that. You would have worked there uh, maybe maybe two hours. It would have been too many hours. It would have been dangerous. I'm not sure if I want you in the New York State Fair at night with a bunch of drunk idiots and, and any number of things. I don't know if you're protected there. But we you know didn't have that conversation then. But the point is, he would need to be in the know to allow me. But the other issue here, getting back now to your piece, is the decades-long campaign to weaken these child labor laws. This doesn't come from nowhere. The, yeah. These all laws are lobbied for and against by the interests who are affected by them. And not nearly enough are, are lobbied against because there's no one representing them like soil or plants. Anyway, so yeah. um, who is who is behind weakening these child labor laws? Yeah. So when we were looking through donations, we noticed that Coke had um, contributed a lot to the sponsors of the law which kind of raised the question of like, okay, what does, you know, what stake does Coke have in advancing this piece of legislation? And it was then that we kind of realized that like for decades, the Coke network has been, you know, driving efforts to undermine child labor protections. And I was surprised to even learn that as early as 1980, when David Coke, who has passed away, ran, uh, was selected to be the vice presidential nominee for the Libertarian Party. Like he literally ran on a platform that essentially promised to just get rid of all child labor laws. So not even like, oh, let's weaken them or let's create some more, you know, loopholes for kids to work, but just outright, like, we're just going to get rid of them. And so since then, uh, you know, the Coke network, so they're all their Coke funded like think tanks have published a lot of pieces that 
try to normalize child labor, you know, try to kind of pitch it as like, this could be good for kids. You know, this is important for child development. They shouldn't just be having fun and playing and like whatever, engaging in their hobbies, but they should, there's actually something for them to learn from working. And it's interesting too, because sometimes some of these pieces were in response to, you know, in one case, it was like in response to like this Washington Post article that was like a photo essay of child laborers in 1900s America, which was yeah. at a time when child labor was very common. And, you know, the fight to stop those child labor efforts was really like, I mean, it was just intense. And it was just such a profound, like, you know, it's amazing that we were able to kind of get past that just because at the time. Yeah, like, no, I, I mean, mean Supreme it was just like, Court. <laughs> The, the uh, court decisions at every level, yeah. laws at every level, agencies created to protect. Yeah. I mean, there's there's I after I, I've been really learning a lot about it since I, I saw your piece and the history of it. I still know very little. But, yeah, there's I, I think it's one of these things, Tess, where like it happened so, long enough ago. And this is true, unfortunately, of a lot of bad things that you forget it was a thing. And I, too, went back and saw that photo essay. And I was like, oh, he has these kids just covered in in coal soot. Yeah. And and broken and bloodied. And and we joke about how far we've come. But I guess when a certain amount of time passes, what it seems like is trying to happen is that we're we're being put back there or trying to yeah. be sold it again, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, they I think in one of the pieces that we included in the article, the author basically was kind of like, you know, we shouldn't be congratulating ourselves. We should actually be questioning, like, why we don't have kids working anymore. And it was just, like, such an insane conclusion to kind of come to. But beyond blog posts and articles, of course, you know, there's been also this, like, intense lobbying. So ALEC, so the American Legislative Exchange Council, yeah. which is heavily Koch-funded, as well as the National Federation of Independent Businesses, which is a trade association that also takes um, a lot of Koch money, so those two groups have been really instrumental in pushing and just really kind of going after efforts, uh, going after, you know, efforts to kind of just get rid of these uh, labor protections for children. And so this is something that's been going on since, yeah, I think uh, I want to say the last two-ish decades or last decade, primarily. Actually, don't quote me on that. Sorry. I don't think that's accurate. But since 2011, at least, ALEC has been implicated. And then the National Federation of Independent Business, their efforts kind of came to light last year after an article from the American Prospect, where they were kind of showing how they were using the labor shortage as justification to kind of push for these like really regressive bills. It's really important. I'm just getting started learning about it. I'm glad that you uh, are working on this and following this. I'm sure you'll unfortunately have to write more pieces about it. And I want to hear from folks. Uh, I guess my last question is the one thing, um, you know, this piece isn't about root causes of, of the problem. You're talking about the history of, of the lobbying. You're talking about what's happening currently in several states around the country, which is super informative. But I mean, it feels like there a lot of this has to do with immigration. I'm not I'm wondering if you learn much about that. I feel like in some of the investigations we've seen, you're seeing a lot of migrant labor uh, kids being being used uh, in, 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 in fact. And often if there were laws that allowed them to be here, then they could work legally like other 16 year olds. But because there aren't, I mean, this shortage of labor where you need younger and younger people to work is also as a result of our immigration laws is the point I'm, I'm trying to make, is my understanding. Did you see anything like that? I think that's definitely related. There was that New York Times piece earlier this month that kind of really showed the extent to which we have these migrant child laborers working in like such hazardous conditions. Like I think there were like these stories of kids working like at the Cheeto packaging factory. And these are kids who are not only in school, but they're also like sending money back home. And so I think it's definitely like a layered issue and that's not something we looked into for this piece, but there is obviously that, uh, you know, critical component yeah, as well. For sure. But wow. I think, I think your I think your hypothesis that like this has to do with the fact that we're not letting in immigrants to like come work definitely is probably valid, right? Like there's a labor shortage. So like you would think that this would be an opportunity to welcome in more people, but instead they're like, let's, does anyone have any like, you know, free 12 year old? I mean, 14 year old, it's not 12, hopefully, but. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining me. Really appreciate your work and look forward to having you back. Please. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thanks for, for having me. Yeah, absolutely. We'll Glad do it again. This was a good time. It was a good time. Two great guests on the show today for the first time. Alyssa Court. Tesneem Zakaria showing the power of the show and the creativity to try to continue to get new people, new voices here 
on the program. Hope you appreciated it. Thank you very much for supporting it. I hope to see you tonight. I hope to hang out with you on our hangout tonight at 8 p.m. If you're a subscriber, if you're not, sign up now. Go to standupatpeat.com because it's a free show, but it's not cheap. It costs a lot to put this together. I put in a lot of hours every day, and now I've got my intern, Odessa, doing a great job. Thank you to John Carroll. Thank you to Pete Coe for every day's voiceover announcement. We love you guys, and I uh, that's it. That's all. I'm going to stop talking. I'll talk to you tomorrow, although the show will be up a little late tomorrow probably because I'm going skiing with Pop today. So hopefully everything, I'll get back uh, on time for the, the hangout, and then uh, we'll, we'll get up a show tomorrow for sure. Looking forward to it. All right, that's it. I'm done. Bye-bye. For your fence, even if it ain't a very friendly audience, well, they'll begin to listen when you start making sense and you stand up, stand up. No need to point your rifle to defend your town, just stand up, stand up. You know they can't deny you what you're laying down, boy, you better stand up, stand up. Show your face of every color, yellow, black, red, and brown. Stand off ground and then stand up, stand up. Well, the founding fathers saw a land for all. They had to stand up, they had to stand up. They had a keen imagination for a crystal ball, drawing all the plans of the stand up. But all they had to go on was the time they were in with other causes for laws. And since they weren't even sent, they knew that change was going to come before the change could begin. They had to stand up. All right, they had to stand up. We got to stand up. We got to look the devil square in the eye. We got to let him know it's his time to go and make it clear when all we hear is a lie. See him flee the scene of that experiment If you stand up stand All right, up. we got to speak up We got to reach up And raise your voice in every way you know how Don't be toes up, you got to show up Ain't no better time to do it but now No need to pledge allegiance to no wanton tribe Rise up, show up to the voice inside and listen well and it'll tell you not to run and hide it says stand up 